So let's try to make use of the theory in solving some numerical problems and strengthen our understanding of the theory. So we have three situations. The first one is where you have two charges, Q1 and Q2, and you have to find the force on Q1 due to Q2. This seems pretty simple. The second one you have is you continue to have Q1 and Q2 at the respective positions, but a new charge Q3 has been introduced and it is a negative charge at a distance of 3 by 4 r from q1 uh, remember q2 is at a distance r and all the values of q1 q2 q3 and r are given in the problem and we'll put those values as we go ahead and solve the problems now the third case is the toughest where you have charge q1 and you are expected to find the force on q1 on account of q2 and q4 which is at an angle theta from the horizontal at an angle of 60 degrees and it is negatively charged. So the level of problem increases as you move from one to three. So let's go ahead and solve problem number one. So the force on charge one due to two, and we'll continue to use this notation where we put the number of the charge on which the force has to be found as the first number. So the force on one due to two can be written using Coulomb's law, which is K into Q1 into Q2 divided by the distance between the two squared. And if you substitute the values, it's given that the value of Q1 is 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulombs and Q2 is 3.2 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulombs. So we know K is equal to 8.99 into 10 to the power 9. So let's go ahead and substitute the values. Q1 is 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulombs into Q2, which is given as 3.2 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulombs. And we divide this by the distance square, which is given as 0 0.02 meters. And if you calculate this, what you get is this equals 1.15 into 10 to the power minus 24 newtons. Now, you would clearly realize that this is the magnitude of the force and we have to find the direction as well. And we know that since both the charges are positive, Q2 is positive, Q1 is positive, Q2 would repel Q1 in this direction. So there are two ways of writing the direction of this force. Either we can say that this is 1.15 into 10 to the power minus 24 Newton and 180 degrees from the positive x direction, if we consider this as the x-axis. Or the other way is to write it in ij notation, and we can see that the force is acting in this direction or the negative i direction, so we can write this as minus 1.15 into 10 to the power minus 24i. This therefore is in IJK notation. Now let's go ahead and solve problem number two. So in problem two, the only difference is that we've introduced another charge in between Q1 and Q2. But as per superposition principle, the force on Q1 on account of Q2 should remain unchanged. So all we need to do is find the force on Q1 due to Q3 and then add that force with a force that is impressed by Q2 on Q1 and we'll have to do this vectorially. So first let's go ahead and find what is the force on 1 due to 3. So what we can write is force on 1 due to 3 is again we'll use the same formula which is Coulomb's law and we put the value of k as 8.99 into 10 to the power 9 multiplied by the charge q1 which we know is 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulombs and q3 in the problem is given as 3.2 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulombs so it's same as q2 but it is at a distance of 3 by 4 r. So in the denominator, what we have is 3 by 4 r square, or we can write it as 0 
into r which is 0 0.02 meters squared and when you solve this what you get is this equals 2.05 into 10 to the power minus 24 newtons now once again this is just the value or the magnitude of the force and we have to find what is the direction of this force so we can clearly see that Q3 will tend to pull Q1 because they are opposite charges. So the force would act in this direction. So if we were to put the force vectors, this is how they would look. So this is Q1 and the force on 1 or Q1 due to 2 would act in this direction because it's a repelling force. But force on 1 due to Q3 would act in this direction. So you have two clear vectors. And you can see that force on 1 due to 3 is in the positive i direction. So if you were to put this in uh, ij connotation, the vector would be multiplied just by i over here. So if you multiply this with i, what you will get is this force F13 in vector notation. Now it's pretty simple. All you need to do is sum up the forces vectorially. So we can say that net force on 1 is equal to force on 1 due to 2 plus force on 1 due to 3. And since we are doing vectorial addition, we need to put an arrow on top. Otherwise, it looks like an algebraic addition. So now what you need to do is sum up the two forces. We know that force on 1 due to 2 is nothing but minus 1.15 into 10 to the power minus 24i. And we know force on 1 due to 3 is calculated as 2.05 into 10 to the power minus 24 newtons and in positive i direction. So when you sum these up, what you get is this equals 9 into 10 to the power minus 25 newton in i direction so you see that the net sum of these two forces is in positive x direction or plus i direction so if you move on to the third case where in addition to q2 you have q4 over here which is at a distance of 3 fourth of r and at an angle of 60 degrees so theta here is 60 degrees so once again we know the force on q1 due to q2 what we need to do is find force on q1 due to q4 so first we'll go ahead and find the magnitude of this force which can be given as f1 due to 4 as equal to k q1 q4 upon r square and we'll go ahead and substitute the values in the formula k q1 q4 upon 3 by 4 r square because here the distance is 3 by 4 of r and we'll not actually put the values here but we'll calculate it aside and what we find is that this comes to 2.05 into 10 to the power minus 24 newtons and now we we have found the value the magnitude what we need to do is convert it into vector form and to do so, what we'll do is we'll write F14 or force on 1 due to charge 4 as equal to F14, the magnitude, into cos theta, this is a horizontal component, into I plus magnitude of force on 1 due to 4 into sine theta into J, which is the y component and you can clearly see that q4 is pulling q1 in this direction so your x component would point in this direction and the y component would point in this direction so let's go ahead and substitute the values we've calculated f14 as 2.05 into 10 to the power minus 24 and if you multiply this with cos of theta or cos of 60 degrees what you get is this equals 1.025 into 10 to the power minus 24 i plus f14 sine theta would come to 1.775 
into 10 to the power minus 24 j. So what you've done is we multiplied 2.05 into 10 to the power minus 24 with cos of 60 degrees. So let me go ahead and write that this is equal to 60 degrees. So we found the horizontal component first or the x component. Then we've gone ahead and multiplied 2.05 into 10 to the power minus 24 into sine of 60 to get this value. So you have F14 in its vector form and now it becomes very simple that the net force on one due to Q2 and Q4 is equal to the vector sum of force on one due to two plus the force on one due to four. Now we know that the force on one due to two is equal to minus 1.15 into 10 to the power minus 24i which we've calculated over here and force on 1 due to 4 so this is what it is so I, what I've done is I've added this to this and what you get is this therefore equals minus 1.15 Two five into ten to the power minus twenty five i plus one point seven eight into ten to the power minus twenty four j. So you can see that the distribution of charges results in forces in different directions. So you have to find them in vector form and simply add them. So if you're good in vectors, you'll find these problems really easy to execute. So my suggestion is if you have some doubts about vectors, go back to my lesson on vectors. There are good six lessons followed by about 15 problems and you'll really be up to speed to solve problems in electrostatics.